Hello and a very warm welcome to uh, EDGE's virtual headquarters uh, and to this webinar where we're bringing together some absolutely fantastic guests, the chairs of some of the most important commissions, uh, committees and, and groups uh, in this space that we are working in uh, and all trying to support. And we're, we're really trying this afternoon to uh, kind of give you a lot of information in one place. So it's gonna be quite a rich session and hear from, uh, from all of these different um, organizations and groups, but also to start to find the really clear links and the common themes and the patterns uh, between all of the amazing work that's being done in this space. So uh, just a few housekeeping notices. I know we're all very uh, used to Zoom meetings by this point in, in the proceedings, but uh, this session is going to be recorded. And obviously for colleagues who uh, can't um, uh, make, us make it live, uh, they'll have an opportunity to, uh, to, to listen in and watch this again. Um, you can use the, the chat, obviously, to, uh, to stay in touch with each other. And we've got a Q&A section at the bottom. That's the place to uh, place your questions and answers. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'll get to them all because I know there'll be a lot, um, but it would be wonderful if you could share those down, uh, down there. Um, and then I'll be able to pick from some of them as we come to talk to some of the panelists. Um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do during the first part of the session is introduce each of our panelists in turn and ask them to speak for about five minutes just to share some of the key messages from their fantastic work so far. Uh, and then I'll have a bit of a chance to, to, to quiz and, and discuss with them uh, before we move on to, to the next and we'll work our way through the panel that way. And then we'll have some time at the end to really try and bring together some of the key messages and to share some of the questions that you might have as well. So without further ado, I'd really like to welcome first to the virtual stage, uh, Rachel Sylvester, who is chair of the Times Education Commission. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Ollie, and thanks so much for organising this to you and to Edge Foundation. I think it's really important. It's going to be a fascinating session. Uh, and what I think so interesting is that uh, in the work we've done, there seems to be a real consensus emerging about the need for reform and the need to reconnect education with employment. And what's so interesting to me is that there are so many commissions uh, external from government looking at this. Uh, and I think it's partly because there's a vacuum in the political world. None of the parties really have any significant ideas on education reform at all, um, even though the world is changing at this astonishing rate. Um, so the Times Commission was set up last June uh, and we're working for a year with uh, proposals and recommendations coming out in June this year. We published our interim report in January, which um, you can get online, I'm sure Ollie can put into the chat. Um, and we're, we're looking at the whole scope right through from early years through to higher education and lifelong learning, really because once we started to think about it, we realised that all those constituent parts are so interconnected, it's very hard to separate out one element. And we felt that everything just, we had to look at the whole gamut, even though it makes it very ambitious. Um, and we're also trying to, to look at to seek opinion from as wide a range of people as possible. So we're not just talking to educators and politicians and think tanks. We're speaking to businesses, we're speaking to artists, theatre directors. We've had Anthony Gormley, the sculptor, come and speak to us, Steve McQueen, the um, film director, James Dyson, the entrepreneur, uh, um, Kate Bingham, the vaccine uh, person, um, Jeremy Farrar from the Wellcome Trust. So we, we want to really look at what does, edu what does the education need to, what does a country need as a whole from its education system? Not just what do schools need, what does politics need? What does the country as a whole need? Uh, and what's been so striking to me coming into this world from the outside is that education does seem to have become stuck in this slightly sterile debate between knowledge and skills it's not even really left and right anymore although it is kind of slightly caught up in that as well it's a knowledge v skills um really quite old-fashioned way of looking at the world um and 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 the education really in many ways hasn't moved on since the 19th century um and that we've you know the world is changing at this astonishing rate you look at the developments in ai in new technologies, um, you look at the sort of inequalities that we've got in the system still, uh, and, the, and schools, colleges and universities just haven't caught up. They're not giving children the skills that they're going to need for the 21st century. Um, and some of the things that we've found so far, which to me have been very shocking and um, interesting, 
So two thirds of parents don't think that the education system prepares their children for either life or work. When you think about it, that is pretty basic. Um, but also 75% of businesses, we, we had a survey done um, in association or by PwC, the consultants uh, of businesses, 75% of businesses have had to give um, new recruits some kind of training in basic skills. Um, and there was an analysis that we were given by the Commercial Education Trust, which found that reforming education to make it more commercially relevant would give an economic boost of £125 billion a year. So the prize is enormous in this economically, as well as in terms of social justice. And when you think that a third of children are failing their GCSEs effectively, not getting a good maths and English, uh, something is going seriously wrong. And when you look at the crisis in mental health, uh, you know, it's just not serving the children. If, if education is supposed to create, uh, you know, citizens who can live happy, purposeful lives, at the moment, despite all the brilliant, fantastic things that many teachers, many schools, uh, many colleges are doing, as a whole, systemically, something's going wrong. And a lot of teachers have said to us, and a lot of head, lit school leaders, college leaders have said they feel they're working almost despite the system. So even their successes are, are, are going against the grain of what's become an increasingly um, old fashioned system. And the other thing that struck me is just looking around the world. So I've been to Estonia, I've been to Finland, I'm hoping to go to Silicon Valley and virtually, if not really, in, in, in the flesh to Singapore and Shanghai, is that Britain, and particularly England, actually, is increasingly an outlier in terms of the international comparisons. Andrea Schleicher of the OECD is, is our international advisor, and he points out that the focus on what, what he calls 21st century competences and creativity are increasingly valued in other countries. So Estonia, for example, I went to schools where they teach robotics from the age of seven. They're, they're, and it, digital skills are woven through the whole curriculum. It isn't a kind of computer science course tacked on to the end of the day. Um, and Andrea Schleicher says that it's only in England, really, where extracurricular is a thing. Theatre, um, you know, oracy, um, sport are woven through the curriculum in many other countries. In Finland, where I was recently, they, they have a whole curriculum about fake news to try and strengthen the democracy. So these other, these other sort of much broader view of education in Singapore and in Shanghai, they've completely turned the system on its head to put creativity at the center. And yet here, uh, it's still a very narrow uh, knowledge driven curriculum uh, and creativity is frowned upon in fact well-being is seen as something sort of happy clappy slightly tree hugging um whereas actually you know uh, well-being should be if, if we want to create resilient children that's got to be at the heart of it um we had very powerful evidence from james dyson who pointed out that if we want to create the next generation of entrepreneurs and inventors like him then you need to have creative creativity at the heart of the curriculum you know design and technology uh, has fallen off a cliff since the introduction of the EBAC accountability measure. But that is, in his view, what creates the engineers of the future on which the country's economic fortunes are going to depend, uh, let alone the satisfaction of its citizens. Um, so I'm so pleased to be part of this, Ollie, and thank you for organising it. And I think that there is a real kind of synergy between what all the commissions are finding, which also chimes with what other countries are doing, in fact, increasingly. Um, so, in fact, it, it, I, I mentioned England as an outline. In fact, Scotland and Wales are uh, looking at much more broader versions of things as well. There's innovations going on there that it, England uh, are ignoring. Um, and it just strikes me, you know, that increasingly it feels as if it's, a it's an analog system in a digital age. Uh, and that we're stuck in, in a slightly groupthink mentality where there's only one way of doing things. And actually that's not true. Uh, and I, 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 I think that even if the politicians uh, won't accept that, uh, I think that perhaps pressure from outside commissions like those gathered in this webinar can make the case that 
Um, there's an economic case for reform, there's a social justice case for reform, uh, and there's a, a, a you know, human case for reform that children, so your children and young people can fulfill and live their best lives. Thank you so much for starting us off so well, Rachel. That's absolutely great. Just a couple of things that I wanted to pick up kind of first, first off the bat. The first really was um, just you mentioned a lot about skills for the 21st century and the, the, the kind of evidence you've heard from employers and the piece of research with the with the Commercial Education Trust. Just just tease out for us because there are lots of different kind of um, uh, measures in that space. But what, what were you hearing as those skills that are needed? So they, I mean, it's incredibly uh, uniform. The message coming across uh, that employers want more communication skills, teamwork, empathy, emotional intelligence, as well as academic intelligence. Uh, you know, practical things like time management, uh, the ability to sort of start self-starting, not expecting to be spoon-fed, resilience. Uh, in a way, the character qualities. Um, that uh, are so important and that in fact the, the private schools do teach very well and there's a danger I think of that kind of social divide widening if the state system doesn't catch up and certainly in Estonia and in Finland the two countries I visited all those skills are now absolutely central to the curriculum they see everything through that it's not a sort of add-on and of course uh, they teach the knowledge and knowledge is absolutely essential but it's not the only thing. Uh, children need both knowledge and skills. They don't just need one. Uh, and I think to disapprove of that concept of skills is a huge mistake. Thank you, Rachel. And you mentioned a couple of the kind of blockers that you've seen in your evidence as well. Um, it, the, the lovely uh, EBAC, um, the English Baccalaureate measure. What do you see as kind of the, the what's getting in the way, really, of, of the system catching up and kind of focusing on, as you say, that balance, not one or the other, but that balance of, of knowledge and skills and, and attributes? Well, we haven't yet reached our conclusions, so I don't want to sort of preempt our recommendations, but certainly the sort of uh, the, the race for more and more exams and the mark scheme uh, and the assessment of um, the EBAC accountability measure, which um, takes five traditional subjects as the measure, a measure of success, that does seem to be driving curiosity and creativity out of the system. Uh, creativity is seen as a dirty word, and I don't think it should be. Curiosity, there just isn't space or time for it. So one of our commissioners, Lucy Kellaway, um, the founder of now teach, who, who's a teacher in a East London school, she talked, described how she was in an economics class um, a few months ago and a, a child asked an absolutely brilliant question about tax. She said they could have spent a whole hour answering that question and the children would have learned so much about how the economy actually works. But there just wasn't any time because she had six more slides to get through to get through the mark scheme so that her kids were going to be prepared for the exams that they had to do. And rightly that in, under the current system, they have to succeed in if they're going to move on to the next stage. But she just felt that the balance had gone wrong, that there wasn't enough space or time for curiosity. And in the end, if we can't nurture curiosity, then there's something going seriously wrong in an age when you know, children are going to have to, maybe, and, you know, keep working longer and longer, children starting primary school now, many of them will live to 100, they're going to retrain, having to retrain many times, um, you know, we have to inculcate that love of learning. And also with the rise of AI, we need to encourage the human skills because the robots are going to do more and more of those uh, routine tasks. Rachel, thank you so much for starting us off so well. And you've laid a little breadcrumb trail there for Lord Chipley next and on assessment for some of our colleagues as well. You can see Lord Chipley uh, uh, enjoying that. So I'd love to welcome uh, you to the virtual stage, Lord Chipley, uh, Chair of the uh, House of Lords Committee on Youth Unemployment that I was privileged to support as uh, one of the specialist advisors last year. Do you want to share some reflections from that work, Lord Chipley? Well, Ollie, I would, and thank you very much indeed for organising uh, this seminar. And thank you for your contribution, along with Kathleen Hennahan from the Resolution Foundation um, and our own staff. Um, we have a, a huge report. I try and show it to people. It's uh, over 200 pages long, and um, I can't do that justice, as you will realise, in five minutes. Um, I commend it to be read. 
and it has reached a lot of places I'm very pleased about, and uh, we await a government response. I'm told it could be imminent, but uh, uh, we'll then have a full debate on the uh, on the floor of the uh, the, the House. Um, Rachel, I want to pick up two things from what Rachel said. The first is four words. The prize is enormous. If we get this right, the prize is indeed enormous. And of course, um, uh, um, I think that our report, it looks to me as though it's going to be complementing uh, the report of the Times Education Commission and others. And so I'm really pleased by that. Um, let me just pursue one point that uh, Rachel, because it's terribly important. And, and that is the creative subjects um, uh, and the design and technology. We have figures here which show that from 2010, there's been a 70% decline in GCSE entries in design and technologies uh, and a 40% decline in GCSE entries in creative subjects. And that does not apply in the private sector. It's not like that. And actually, Rachel's entirely right about the divide that is being uh, 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 created. Look, our committee was set up um, in, uh, 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 during the COVID crisis um, and spent mo most of uh, last year uh, investigating what the impact on young people in terms of their employment was going to be. And uh, we took evidence from a very large number of people, but in particular, young people themselves. And um, uh, we were in uh, uh, South East Lancashire, in the East Midlands, based on Derby, in London, and then with various national organisations, uh, third sector organisations, getting advice from them. Look, the, the problem is a huge, deep-seated deep problem. Our report is called Skills for Every Young Person. The clue is in the title, Skills for Every Young Person. By young, we mean under 25. Um, uh, you could give it a different title, which is the other 50%. Um, and uh, uh, it's about those kids that don't have no expectation and don't go to university and for whom that academic route um, through a uh, Progress 8, uh, they're actually being constrained in the committee's view uh, by the way in which the national curriculum uh, works. Meanwhile, we have a persistent skills mismatch in this country in which employers are trying to recruit staff um, to do jobs that they can't get and in which students uh, aren't being taught the skills that they need to apply for those jobs. One of the consequences of this is that in terms of youth unemployment under 25, uh, half a million young people are looking for work today. But 600,000 young people are not in uh, education, employment or training. Um, we, we have to spend more time and effort and uh, money on the other 50 percent. Uh, and I go so far as to say that the talents of some of our students are being suppressed through the current school system. We need to plan better with the national curriculum, particularly in digital skills, creative and design technology. Employers are going to have to spend more on training. Governments are going to have to help poorer students, um, uh, particularly those who may, for example, in T-levels, uh, be living quite away from a place where they can get the work experience that they need. Um, there was a very, very good article by Martin Wolf um, of the Financial Times um, a few uh, weeks, I feel, well, two or three months ago now, on how the basket con uh, autonomy drove leveling up of people in the Basque area. Because this, you see, leveling up is seen to be about places, unfortunately, in our national discourse. Actually, it's about leveling up people. And um, the way you do it is by investing more in the other 50%. We are very poor at forecasting. The government is very poor. Whitehall is very poor. Um, the green economy, um, uh, I am not optimistic that the training systems, the needs of the green economy are there in the education system to produce the outcomes that employers are going to need. <clears throat> we don't invest enough, our report said, in levels two and three. And further education funding system needs to be much more like the university system, whereby funding follows uh, what it is that, that, uh, that young people want to do. Interestingly, next Friday, we have a debate in the House of Lords on careers guidance in schools. Um, careers guidance isn't preparing young people for the real jobs market. 
um, work experience has declined. Uh, too few young people in schools know what the skills are they need to be successful at work. And um, there are not now enough apprenticeship opportunities for young people who want to do them. Uh, 10 years ago, we had over half a million apprenticeship uh, opportunities a year. Now we have only 300,000. And of the 19 to 24 age, uh, well, well, 19 to 24 age range largely, uh, 10 years ago was 300,000 doing apprenticeships. Now it's 175,000. I'm not going to quote many more figures because they're all in this report, but those for me are very serious, uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 demonstrate a serious problem. Uh, that um, uh, there just aren't enough apprenticeship places. And um, uh, there's lots of reasons for that. The levy is not working properly, and uh, there's been a huge growth in apprenticeships of the over 25s for a whole variety of uh, reasons. Look, um, Ollie, I'll, I'll draw slowly to an end, but um, we have to recalibrate the national curriculum. Uh, we cannot have a national curriculum that broadly pursues an academic um, uh, uh, curriculum at the expense of the creative, the digital skills that uh, kids need, never mind uh, the economy. Um, the apprenticeship levy, I think, is going to have to uh, be more geared to the needs of younger apprenticeships, not the older apprenticeships. Um, there's a strong argument for saying that employers themselves should be meeting many of the demands of their workforce um, uh, um, who are older. We had a lot of um, 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 evidence about um, uh, uh, equalities, disadvantage. Um, we call for a workplace race equality strategy to be brought in. But we took a look at um, uh, prisons, um, at uh, children of travellers. What happens to them? I mean, we got a, a, a huge amount of extremely valuable evidence. Um, young people with disabilities, what support are they being given? Um, anyway, a huge amount on our report about all of that. Oli, you were there when we decided we wanted to call for the new independent young people's commissioner to be the voice of young people, 16 to 24. There is a children's commissioner which runs to the age of 18. We want to start at 16, there's a slight overlap there, which we'd have to talk about. But you see, there are nine ministers in Whitehall, nine with responsibilities for young people in one way or another. We did think about uh, saying there should be a minister for youth um, uh, employment or unemployment. Scotland's actually gone that route. So we look at that with great interest. But actually, we concluded what we really needed was a young people's commissioner who was going to be uh, bringing people together across Whitehall uh, rather than um, uh, um, uh, allowing them all basically to be doing their own thing. I shall be happy that our report has been successful when I see outside secondary schools and high schools banners advertising not just Ofsted results or their university entrance numbers, but the number of apprenticeships that their students have gone on to. That was that is my definition of success. And I never want to think that in the years ahead, we're going to have 22% of 18 year olds not in education or work based training or 11% of our 18 to 24 year olds not in education, employment or training. The waste is uh, is uh, is uh, really quite appalling. Thank you so much, Lord Shipley. Passionate as ever. I think some really close links back to what Rachel was uh, introducing there around creativity, around uh, technical education, and the need for for those to be much more central to the curriculum. Um, I saw some cheering in the chat from design and technology teachers in the room. Um, also, some links forward to what Serene will be saying about the kind of FE sector, as you said, that kind of potential focus on younger uh, apprentices, uh, that kind of uh, questioning of the levy. And Lord Shipley, we, you heard from a lot of young people as part of your report. We, we had focus groups up and down the country. Just, just reflect a little bit for us on what you were hearing directly from, from them. Well, we had um, uh, just about every um, um, uh, uh, kind of angle that you can think of from 
uh, uh, those who um, have uh, um, achieved a great deal, others who have um, uh, achieved uh, um, a bit less. Um, there was a geographical difference as well. Let me just give you two examples, and I think to respond to that, um, of um, uh, um, a, a young person in uh, um, uh, Burnley uh, who, uh, who said to us that um, he went to the job centre and thought he was just a statistic. The objective of the staff was to tick the box to say that he'd been got into some employment. He said, I was grateful for that in one respect, but he said, actually, it wasn't the employment I wanted. I've now managed to put that right, but he said, I didn't get any help. But then let me just refer you to Simon Reeve, Desert Island Discs Radio 4, about four or five weeks ago. He said, he was virtually set, well, his words were saved, I think, by somebody in a job centre who said, who, who listened to what he felt his problems were and gave him life changing advice. And I think I drew from all of that, a person can make a profound difference to an individual. And many of the young people that we listen to, and several dozen uh, people, yeah, many of those have been profoundly influenced by a single person. Thank you, Lord Chipley. That's a really nice place to, to end that initial uh, input. And just to pick up um, very briefly, one point you mentioned about the need for thinking about kind of broader destinations, broader measures of success that would include apprenticeships. Uh, we published some research yesterday with the National Foundation for Education Research uh, using the really rich LEO data set that the Department of Education has uh, to look much further forward, to look five, ten years after young people have left schools and colleges um, to see the kind of possibility that those longer term destinations might have um, as one of the kind of different uh, measures and understandings that schools can have. So I'll pop a link to that in the chat uh, just as I finish uh, speaking. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Lord Shipley. Um, we're going to narrow down. Rachel and Lord Shipley had a particular challenge in summarising such broad pieces of work. Um, Louise still has a challenge, but her work is slightly more focused. So I wanted to welcome to the, to the virtual stage Professor Louise Hayward, who chaired the Independent Assessment Commission. Louise, over to you. Thank you very much, Ollie. And this is so exciting. I noticed that one of the, the respondents in chat asked the question, when so many exciting things are going on, why haven't things happened? And I think this um, event um, is a real focus for that. It's because all the different um, people involved in the, the different commissions need to come together. And there needs to be a sense of a tidal wave for change. So I hope that that might be one of the the, the output, outcomes of, the, of today. But as Ollie said, um, I'm um, talking about the work of the Independent Assessment Commission, funded by the NEU, but a completely independent position. And so much in common with the speakers who've gone before. One very clear message coming from across all of the communities, it's time for a new era for assessment and qualifications and how they link to the curriculum. Assessment and qualifications that are equitable and reliable and that serve all of young people and society well. The IEC listened to students, to parents, teachers, employers, researchers and policymakers, all of whom were part of the commission. We took evidence through interviews, questionnaires, focus groups, discussions held at political party conferences, from research and from practice internationally. So what might a better future look like? And I'd like to start by listening to the voices of young people. Some kids get extremely stressed, like myself, to the point where they're thinking, what's the point? Elizabeth understands the impact that what were often described to us as cliff edge exams can have on health and well-being. A better system would allow young people to show what they know, what they understand, what they're able to do, to help them to build the confidence, to work collaboratively, to tackle problems. It would provide different approaches to assessment. Examinations would be one approach to demonstrating achievement, but not the only approach, not just exams. Krish says, we're just learning how to pass exams. Our whole mind is focused on that. He understands the way in which the current system narrows the curriculum. Everyone teaches to the test and often reduces education to three years of practicing for exams. A better system would have a closer link between what matters for young people, 
in society, in college or university, in employment. There are very few occasions in life where I've been asked to sit on my own without access to books or the internet and write what I know. And yet that's what we're still asking of young people. Harvey understands the way in which the system controls the number of students who are allowed to succeed. When everything is set out on an exam basis, he said, there are people set out to fail. A better system would recognize that if a young person meets the criteria for an award, then they should have the award. The current system leaves a forgotten third that turns young people off education that leads to undue stress. And that is simply not acceptable in a 21st century democracy. But it's not only the forgotten third, our commission believes, who are not well served by the current system. Teachers spoke of young people who will only work when the stakes are high. And some of us, who might be described as successful learners, carry that through life. We're high stakes dependent. We're only able to work in a focused way if there are final deadlines. Employers spoke of having to undo the damage of the current system on young people, who they described as being risk averse, unwilling to persevere with problems, waiting to be spoon fed, and they had a lack of experience in key areas, for example, in working in teams. To make change that's successful, our commission offers a framework to develop three things. One, a vision, a clear idea of what it is that we want qualifications to achieve. And then a set of principles, five principles to use both to design the system and once it's running, to check that it's working as we intend it should. Systems internationally are littered with innovations that begin with good ideas, but as they move into practice, what actually happens in practice diverge from the original aspirations. And thirdly, we need a place to start. And the commission offers 10 recommendations to begin the process. What we're talking about is evolution rather than revolution, but also not being prepared to sacrifice one generation of people, one generation of young people for the benefit of the next. So the essence of what our report is saying England needs a qualification system that recognizes what each person achieves to help them to become the citizens of a society of which we would all like to be part. And that supports each young person on a pathway towards a positive destination, be that in college, employment or university. That supports young people as they transition to the demands of the real world, gathering evidence of the competences that they need to succeed in whatever they choose to do that offer a range of experiences that are closer to what happens in real life. So for example, projects that bring together science, mathematics, technology, and engineering, and assessed as part of day-to-day -day life in classrooms. Qualifications that encourage investigation, deepen understanding, and motivate learners. And that have greater flexibility in ways of gathering evidence. Exams are simply one way of gathering evidence. And yes, part of the system, but also, for example, presentations, oral examinations, problem-solving experiences, a myriad of ways, many of which are now in colleges and universities. And when the evidence is gathered, so for example, when qualifications are undertaken, so that we neither hold people back, nor do we push people to a point where the pressure impacts negatively on their mental health. A-levels were introduced in 1951. At that point, Winston Churchill had just been re-elected as prime minister. The Korean War was taking place and the King and I opened in Broadway. GCSEs were introduced in 1987. Margaret Thatcher was visiting Moscow. The Channel Tunnel had just been given the go ahead and the first IKEA had opened. The world is changing at a rate that societies have never previously had to cope with. Our young people need to be flexible, creative, lifelong learners. We owe it to them to have a qualification system that supports them creatively and flexibly to become the highly motivated lifelong learners that England, English society needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. That was absolutely excellent. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, there's so many points that I, I want to pick up there, but um, I just wanted to share one quote that, that stuck out from me from those young people that we heard from in the commission. There was one young man who said, um, when you're in school, you get assessed on what you can remember. When you're in the workplace, you can get assessed on what you do. 
and that just kind of just summarized it so nicely as as many of the young people that I know Rachel and or Chipley spoke to spoke to as part of their work uh, kind of will have done as well. So I just wanted to ask, uh, like Louise, uh, like Lord Shipley, like Rachel, you've heard from kind of a, a really wide range of different kind of segments from employers, from young people. D to what extent was there a kind of agreement and consensus between them? I don't think, Ollie, in my um, educational life, I've ever come across an area where there was such strong consensus. Um, people are absolutely, um, they speak with one voice about the need for the qualification system to change in order to become better for all young people. Often we hear about the forgotten third. I think the, what was interesting from the commission was that actually this is about every young person in the system. And it's providing people recognizing the world of industry four um, is going to lead to a position where young people are going to have to be flexible in the workplace. There, it is unlikely that young people will have one career throughout their lives. They're going to have to, to change constantly and learning is going to have to be part of that process. So qualifications, rather than simply being about the past and about what has been achieved, been achieved in school, should be a springboard to the future. So it's the first part of a lifelong learning journey and using that term in the way that it was originally intended. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, we're going to stick with the assessment theme now, and I want to welcome Peter Hyman, uh, who is one of the leaders of the Rethinking Assessment Movement. Peter, over to you. Uh, great. Really, really good to be here. And there's so much uh, overlap in what people have talked about. I'm not going to uh, repeat some of the diagnosis that I think we all share about the current system and what needs to change. But I think, as every speaker has said, there is a, a clamour, I would put it as highly as that, for something to change and for reform to happen. Rethinking Assessment was set up about 18 months ago, and it was a very broad coalition of independent schools, state schools, universities, employers, parents and others, who all think something must change. And many of us felt this before the pandemic, but the pandemic and the last two years, and the suspension of exams and the chaos around them has given new impetus to the idea that we need to change the assessment system. And as others have said, it's linked inextricably to the curriculum and the education offer. Because our argument is, if you want a broad curriculum, Rachel mentioned and others have, of knowledge, skills and attributes or dispositions are different words for it, um, and that is a consensus across the world. England, as Rachel says, is an outlier on that. If we want that broad curriculum, then it becomes nonsensical that we're only assessing and evidencing that narrow subset of the knowledge uh, part of it. So we need something broader. So our analysis that we've done in in-depth working groups over six months, very broadly summed up, says that we've got to broaden not just what we assess, to, so that we're taking into account skills and dispositions, as well as knowledge, but how we assess it too. And others have alluded at the idea that, and in fact, Louise was just talking about this, that there are different methods of assessment that are used in universities already. If you're doing an engineering or medical degree, you're ass assessed in about 12 different ways. And of course, employers who are fed up with the qualifications they're getting because they don't think they're a proxy for what they're looking for, are doing what they call strengths-based assessments in order to get to the, all those qualities that we've just talked about. So that I think is a real sense of consensus. What we're about rethinking assessment is not just making the case for change, but practical solutions that will be tested and piloted and case studies will be provided from the schools that we're working with. And when we had a call out of expressions of interest, we've got hundreds of schools who want to be part of that piloting process, another indication of the real appetite for change here. So I want to show, this is embryonic, I'm going to show you one slide, it's not very elegant at this stage, um, but it gives you the sort of direction of travel, because what we're saying is, how about ending up with a learner profile that, I think there are two stages to this. The first stage, which goes with the grain of what's going on at the moment, is to say that learner profile, without any change to the exam system, can at least evidence and give uh, um, recognition 
to the wide range of skills and attributes of every young person. So the first staging post to what we want uh, in the future is to do that. Then the second place is to make that into a holistic qualification because it's only by re-weighting the balance away from just written knowledge exams and making the qualification have to include these other elements in whatever percentage we decide that you'll then change the incentives of what the curriculum then has to do and then what the teaching has to do in a school as well, because they're all linked. So it has to come in those two stages. So let me just show you what that might uh, look like. Um, as I say, not very ele elegant at the moment, but it can, it'll do the following sorts of things that we have at the top, a crucial open-ended and more discursive, I mean, think personal statement for university, think cover letter for going to a job. But this is something that you would start to write about at intervals during your four to 18 school journey, so that you're getting very reflective, which of course is what employers and others are looking for. Do you understand what your strengths are and what you need to get better at and all the rest of it? So how am I doing? What are my strengths? What would I do differently? What do I want to do with my life? OK, and we're starting to reflect on that. And it's crucial, therefore, that this learner profile is not just a, a set of numbers and letters of what what you've achieved in exams, but is a more has a more discursive element. Then we've got in the centre here. And as Rachel and others have said, there's consensus across the world uh, as to the what's often called the three or four C's about creative thinking. We've talked quite a lot today already about collaboration. We call it oracy. Many people call it communication. And the fourth one here, what we're calling at the moment zest for learning, which we think is quite a nice phrase, is those learning habits, which others have touched on today as well, things like resilience and reflection and resourcefulness that are part of being a really good learner. So why I've drawn that as a circle in the middle is that will be a sort of wheel that you've probably seen in other things where you would um, give different spikes within the wheel to what you've really excelled at. And then you can see the other buckets that you would want to fill up with different percentages. Of course, I don't think there's any dispute. You need a foundational core of literacy and numeracy. We would add oracy to that spoken language. And lots of people have mentioned digital, which is a strong candidate for the core. Then it seems to me, and we're doing pilots on this and case studies this year, that we need to, yes, have the traditional single subject history, maths, geography, science, but also there's a growing need for interdisciplinary learning. And there's both in the independent and state, state sector, there are people who are developing, for example, a climate change course that you can take. So why shouldn't every young person take at least one interdisciplinary course as well as the traditional subject? Then the applied learning again has been touched on today, that everyone gets a chance to do real world applied learning. And the people who warrant or, or give the actual qualification and, and moderate it could be the employers themselves on this. Uh, so it doesn't just have to be an exam board. The fourth one, and someone I saw in the chat said, well, why doesn't a student spend 20% of their time pursuing their own questions and their own lines of inquiry? Well, this is exactly what number four is about, is about developing the extended project qualification as a way which is a really robust qualification that people, a lot of people will know about. It's worth at the moment half a A level. It's treated incredibly seriously by universities. Well, let's piggyback on that and let everyone develop a rigorous project of their own. And even now as an EPQ, you can develop either a thesis and a more traditional essay type piece of work or an artifact. So those are some of the buckets. And if you weighted it, and I'm just sort of a bit plucking figures, we're doing a big piece of work on the weighting, but if you said 30 or 40% was on the core, or let's say 30, 40% on number two, um, 10% maybe on number three, 10 or 15 on number four, you've got a sort of qualification here underpinned by those dispositions and the wheel in the middle. And then again, on this digital learner profile, you'd be drawing evidence from your own portfolio of work that are a, a curation of the experiences you've had uh, and the beautiful work, I, it's a phrase we use at School 21, um, the work that you've crafted and created in different areas. And the green blob on the left is to say, as others have mentioned as well, this should all be assessed 
multimodally, which is our slightly jargony way of saying a variety of methods. Um, written exams, yes, still has a place for some things. Um, online digital exams, like they're trialing in Scotland and Wales, that can respond through AI. So you might take your maths exams when ready. There's a very big movement of saying, let's not just have them as terminal exams. At the point when you are ready to take them, like you would with a music exam, uh, between the ages of 11 to 18, you might take them. There are oral exams. There are other forms of assessment as well. So for different, each of these, you can immediately see one, two, three, four, lend themselves to different types of mode of assessment in order to properly evidence what people can do. So it seems to me, just to wrap up on this, that we've got these really in-depth pilots going on, these case studies on oracy, on interdisciplinary learning, on creativity, to really get underneath how we do that in a robust way. And we're starting to pilot this learner profile with a lot of ed tech companies really excited about how we can do this. And I think it, there's a real chance to make this work going forward. So this is just the direction of travel at the moment that we think could be really fruitful to put all of uh, what we believe in the consensus into some kind of format that could work to recognize the strengths of every single child, which is all of our aims. Thank you, Peter. That's great. Um, I saw Helen in the chat was uh, saying that this kind of builds a bit on the national record of achievement for many of us remember those kind of uh, dark red folders that I think you can now buy for about 15 pounds on eBay. But, but you know, that it's important to remember that this is this is new, but also some of this has been tried before. This is not completely new to the system. And it's also not new in the sense that internationally it's building on some really amazing practice as well, isn't it? Yes, and I mean, I always, records of achievement, people go one way or the other. Some are very fond of it. Some think it was a disaster and fell by the wayside. What I would say is we're in a completely different age now with digital technology. And this goes well beyond that. You know, this is something that what we're building in at Rethinking Assessment is this profile to have genuine credibility with universities, with colleges and with employers. And that's our, one of our next pieces of work. So we've already got some universities who say they'll trial it alongside the, the admissions process that they normally go through. We've already got employers saying they will trial it alongside the recruitment. So as soon as we get them using it and it be, gets a currency, I think it will have far more traction and the fact that it's digital than the old records of achievement, which I think has some really good intentions, but what weren't followed through. So I think we're in a new age of making that work and of course we've got other things in the last 10 years that people are just using com as commonplace in their life like of course LinkedIn so this isn't a million miles away from what an adult does when they get on in LinkedIn and they have all their achievements and testimonies and and and, and stuff about them this, this isn't far off that that's really helpful thank you very much Peter and, and just say a little bit about, uh, so we've had a question in from one of the audience about assessing communication skills. And I know as well as uh, your work for Rethinking Assessment, obviously you mentioned School 21 and your work there on Oracy. So just say a little bit about what you've found in terms of assessing communication skills there. Yeah, we're doing that in conjunction with Voice 21, which is our Oracy charity. Um, and of course, the, the challenge with Oracy is how to make it not too time consuming, the assessment for teachers, because unlike a written test where everyone can do it in class at the same time, or you could do it online. So for things like literacy and numeracy, for Oracy, you've got to actually watch young people speak. And what we're going to do is get ways of initially using comparative judgment, which some people may know as a methodology, which gets, you know, which lines up and compares different types of work. We're going to do that with snapshots of video so that you can see, well, that one's better than that for the following reasons. So hopefully this is another pilot and case study we're doing in the coming months. We'll be able to make that into something very practical that teachers can use in the classroom without it being too onerous. And then I think we'll have a real breakthrough on that. That's great, Peter. Thank you. Um, last but not least, amongst our stellar cast, uh, I wanted to welcome to the virtual stage Sirian Diamond, uh, who is here in his role as chair on the, of the Commission on the College of the Future. Um, Sirian, do you want to share a few uh, thoughts about your latest work there? OK, thank you. And uh, I was invited um, a couple of years ago to chair the Independent uh, Commission on the College of the Future. Uh, and it had two pretty simple, but uh, at the end of the day, pretty fundamental questions, which is, uh, what do we want and need from colleges across all four nations uh, of the United Kingdom? Um, 
in 2030 and what changes are needed in order to achieve this and we recognize both the, the changes in demography the changes in technology uh, change in demands of, of, of the labor market uh, and we were really really clear that we needed to go right across uh, the UK to to take the benefits of the different systems that exist uh, and um, to get on the Commission a, a group of if you like real uh, experts but also um, people from um, industry people from unions people from uh, the students uh, and really thinking about what is the role of colleges often as um, anchor institutions in um, their um, in their local areas particularly uh, in terms of encouraging um, social inclusion and social mobility uh, where for some people moving away um from from home in order to study is not necessarily um possible so look we worked really hard had consultation and worked uh, right through 2019 2020 and came out uh with a whole set of reports um reports for each part of the united kingdom uh, and the village is the, the vision is really that the college of the future empowers people throughout their lives uh with skills um, and skills that um, will in, will change over time uh, as people move uh, forward. Um, it will support better productivity, both at a local and national level, and support innovation. And also, as I said, anchor institutions, so strengthening uh, the sense of, of place. As I say, we've made recommendations for each uh, part of, of the UK as well as national ones, and the three. Uh, that I just wanted to 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 mention are uh, firstly um, upskilling uh, people right across uh, the UK by making it possible for everyone to learn throughout their life and to come back at different times and to to be able to transfer uh, knowledge from a different time into a different uh, place and also enabling people to upskill in work so as to be able to move them uh, from say poorly paid work into um, better uh, paid work secondly to drive innovation um, and uh, address skills gap by really working quite closely between employers uh, and their local colleges there's a fantastic piece of work by audrey cumberford and paul little in scotland which really uh, speaks uh, to this uh, and the new in England strategic development fund pilots going taking place in 16 localities uh, across England is, is absolutely aimed at that that colleges have a much more important role than has been recognized in, in the past in terms of uh, really driving uh, innovation uh, and, and the, the, the third point we make very very strongly is that too often um, colleges perhaps have been competitive with each other instead of being collaborative uh, and enabling um, really strong um, partnerships so as to maximize the opportunities for any particular region uh, and uh, we would note the Welsh post compulsory education and training reforms currently going through the Senate uh, uh, as being really, really central to that. So those are three things that I think I'd point to. I would though also um, like to finish by saying a few words about some of the things we are, we are currently doing. Um, we recently published uh, a piece called Going Further and Higher, how collaboration between colleges and universities can transform lives and places. And absolutely clear that in doing this, which we did jointly with the Civic University Network, we're making a very strong point that there shouldn't be colleges and then there should be universities, but actually they should be deeply integrated uh, and the credit should be transferable um, and that um, people may start at a college and for some people, the best thing to do would be to move on into uh, a higher education and we do not want glass ceilings that prevents that happening. For others, then uh, that might be a, 
that the college might be the end point, but then 20 years later, they might want to come back and we need to, to enable that um, to happen. Secondly, uh, we are really working forward uh, to ask how colleges can deliver for local areas and how colleges working together and working together with their local employers can really uh, add uh, serious value. Uh, and then, 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 then finally, um, I just wanted to leave you the idea that you know, we've got real change in the world and what we need are people, employers, and communities who can access education and skills very much more easily and doing so at different times in their life. And therefore it really leads, uh, we would argue, to better join up across the education and skills systems and better uh, join up um, with uh, employers. Uh, and so uh, very looking much looking forward very much to the conversation here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suri, and that was really, really helpful. And that concludes us kind of snapshots of these, these amazing pieces of work. Um, we've already got some great questions and answers coming through. Do feel free to keep adding those. Um, and the, the chairs have already done part of our job for us in making some great links between their work as they were speaking. But to do a bit more of that and take that to the next step, I wanted to welcome Alice Barnard, who is our CEO here at the Edge Foundation, just to reflect on some of the messages coming out from across those. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ollie. And I think uh, all of the audience and participants uh, would agree this has been a very rich discussion. And I think what is uh, very encouraging is the level of agreement and the commonality between uh, everything that we've heard today. And I think from Edge's perspective, I think we felt we knew all of this, but what has been really important is to have a group of individuals, a group of organisations, a group of commission that have all looked into this in great detail, have researched this, have looked at the landscape and have concluded what we all thought we knew, but now we have the evidence to back that up. Um, it's been really interesting to see the Q&A. Um, a lot of it feels uh, like there's a lot of energy uh, behind the fact, and I think Peter used the word clamour for change, but there's also quite a lot of frustration in the sense that people are saying, you know, we, we all agree, we, we think this is a great idea, why is nothing changing? And I did see that Prue Huddleston uh, mentioned in the chat that employers were saying very similar things to, to that that we are, have talked about today in 1884. So I guess part of uh, the role of EDGE is to play this convening role to help bring together these like-minded voices. Uh, and although we often know that our audiences um, are very much on side and agree. It's how we take this to the next level, how we take uh, this uniformity of idea and take it to the next level to actually affect change. Um, there's a number of things that our speakers have said that I was going to pick out, and there is a real commonality um, from everyone. I think one of the things that Lord Shipley said, which I know the, that anyone in design and technology, and there are a few in the chat, have, uh, have been uh, messaging during uh, the conversation, is really interesting to see that huge decline in creative subjects and design and technology in the state sector, but you don't see that commonality and fall in the private sector. So although the challenge from government is always to the state sector, be more like private schools, in fact, everything they're doing is squashing the ability for state schools to be able to provide those underpinning skills for young people to develop the resilience and the skills to be uh, ready for the world of work. And I think we have to start to call out some of these inconsistencies. Um, and we now are building that bank of evidence that we are able to do that. Um, Rachel said something that made me have a wry smile, which was around extracurricular activity, that England is the only nation that has to do this add-on scenario for the bits that actually most of us recognise as being fundamentally important to a young person's experience in school. And we know that in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, these things are seen as, um, as essential to that young person's all-round learning. Yet in England, in Leicester, you're incredibly lucky. Your school is going to be drilling you in maths and English forever and ever because that is the way they're, they're measured and that is the way they're assessed, which leads on to Peter's incredibly important movement, which the Edge Foundation has been involved with from the very beginning, both in terms of, hopefully Peter, you'd agree, time and energy, but also in terms of investment. Yeah. And 
I think in terms of of that group, it's been really interesting to see the evolution um, of the group from an idea stage and agreeing um, what all the issues were and the problems through to the, the point they're at now, which is developing this learner profile and also making sure that we start to trial um, these activities on the ground. Because often the accusation from those that don't agree with us is it's all very well to have the ideas and to have um, academics thinking about what it could look like on paper but the challenge is always well how would that look like in real life how would you pragmatically deliver assessment change in schools to make it in quotes fair and it's interesting to see that increasingly we're able to challenge that uh, misnomer that uh, is used often by those that don't agree with us that exams are the fairest way to assess that isn't true it is probably the easiest way to assess but fairness and easiness ease uh, and ease do not equate to the same thing um, and we've heard today, um, I know Louise was talking about the fact that a third of young people are basically set up to fail. You know, they, this, this collective movement, these voices that we're hearing today, is all about how we make education fair for all. We're not trying to pick out individual groups of young people. We're not looking at it from the point of view of gender. We're not looking at, uh, at this from the point of view of uh, ethnic diversity. We are looking at this fairness for all. And I think that has come across uh, really strongly. Louise also made a really interesting point about employers, and I think um, it's quite sobering. Um, she said that employers are having to undo the damage. Um, I mean, that, that is a huge concern. I mean, firstly, the word damage is a concern because it suggests that young people are coming through the system and they've been broken by it. Um, and I think the fact that employers feel, and it goes back to Prue's quote of uh, 18. 84, that employers feel that the education system is not preparing young people for the world of work. In fact, it's starting to feel like we're setting them up to fail. Um, I think um, having the benefit of this group of experts has really made me uh, consider what it is we need to do next. And listening to uh, in Diamond talking about lifelong learning, the importance of being able to come back with prior knowledge and being able to bank that prior knowledge is obviously really important. The ability to be able to upskill in work also important, which again comes back to some of the themes we've heard today about the fact that young people are going to be working for an ordinary amount of time. They're going to have many different careers. We are asking young people, we're challenging them to work in uh, an environment that at the moment barely exists. So we know they're gonna have a portfolio of careers. So we need to be able to give them the skills and abilities to be able to adapt between those. Um, and so it's really important that we are creating that environment for them to be able to do that. Um, I think it's really interesting that all our speakers have spent some time talking about the devolved nations. And it always appears to me that they're a step ahead of us, if not a step, a country mile in some cases. Um, and Sir Ian picked up that when he was talking about innovation and, and talking about um, the way that um, Scotland was working with colleges and employers. And then he talked about Wales and the collaboration rather than the competition, um, collaboration rather than competition between colleges. Why is it that we're not learning from our immediate neighbors? There's lots of brilliant international examples and uh, Rachel brought up Finland and we've had the benefit of both traveling to a number of other nations before, before COVID and also doing many virtual trips during COVID um, to find out what amazing examples are happening overseas. But actually, you know, our near neighbors are doing things better than we are. Um, and the ability to be able to pick up some of those real life examples is obviously very powerful um, as, uh, as indicators of what could happen here. And I guess finally, my, my reflection is, we have a really strong case here. We have intelligent, dynamic individuals representing organizations and commissions that have done uh, hard slog, deep dive work. They have talked to employers, they've talked to young people, they've talked to parents, they've talked to teachers, they've talked to all the stakeholders that matter in this. And the agreement is solid. So now it's how we take this and we challenge those that don't seem to understand that actually the opportunity to simply um, drill for a knowledge-based curriculum which is narrow and which is harming both our young people's opportunity to, uh, to be able to be the very best they can, uh, but it was also narrowing the opportunity for Great Britain to have an economy that can really be uh, seen as a, as a driver uh, and an international force. So we're, we're harming ourselves twice over. And so the time to act is now, both for economic reasons, 
for, for social impact and to actually make uh, this world, or, or at least our world, our tiny world here, a little bit um, fairer and a little bit safer for young people to operate in. Thank you so much, Alice. That was really helpful to draw together some of those themes. So I'm going to put our panellists on notice now that I've, I've got quite a few quick fire questions, partly from the audience, partly from uh, that, that I wanted to, to cover. So um, shorter answers would be wonderful, if possible. Um, I wanted to start with one for, for you, Lord Shipley. Um, and that's really that there's been a lot of talk in, in the chat and elsewhere uh, about the need for kind of maybe depoliticization of this area um, or kind of a longer term plan that's kind of agreed. Your committee featured peers from right across the political spectrum. Do you think that there might be a way forward there that we could gather some kind of centre ground? I, I think you can. I was very struck by Rachel's comment at the beginning about the fact that no political parties seem to be addressing the problem. And uh, she's absolutely right, they're not. Um, however, I think they're all shortly going to start having to do so because there is a skills crisis in, uh, in Britain. We have a move to a greener economy, and I'm not convinced that the planning for the skills is there. So the consensus will emerge. Um, uh, things will change. So. Um, but change, you know, politicians can often be the people who follow uh, the trend rather than lead the trend. What is needed is that uh, every, everybody who is uh, taking part today and large numbers of other people all have to start campaigning for the, uh, the changes that they want to see. And um, you build a head of steam, don't you, in which everyone starts to agree this is the right thing. Politicians follow it. Excellent, thank you. And Rachel, you were very clear about the evidence that you've seen from employers, uh, that 125 billion figure was you know, a scary and, and a persuasive one. I mean, employers have been saying this for a while. What, why, why is it not cutting through? What can we do to get it to go that extra mile? You're just on mute, Rachel. Sorry. Um, I think politics has got stuck in this kind of old ideological, view. I think politicians are nervous of anything that they perceive as dumbing down, as they call it. Um, but actually, I think parents as well as employers have really changed uh, what they want. And I think the pandemic has really altered people's priorities. Uh, and certainly the polling we've done shows that parents care much more that their children um, are happy and have a good life, you know, good outcomes for their life rather than just pure academic outcomes. So I think politicians may be behind the curve on that. Uh, and one observation from other countries is that um, both Estonia and Finland have 20 or 30, 15, 20, 30 year joint strategies agreed between the parties, uh, you know, so whether it's a decade, two decades, you need to, this has to be a long-term thing. So you take the politics out of it and actually you involve business, you involve um, experts, the dreaded experts, Michael Gove doesn't, has had enough of, but you involve, you involve different kinds of stakeholders. So you can't have it just um, hijacked by, by politics. Thank you, Rachel. And um, Louise, Rachel used the word rigorous, uh, which came up a lot. And we talked a lot in the commission about those different words and the buttons they push. Are exams just more rigorous? Are, are they the only fair way? Is, is that correct? No. Um, you asked for a short answer. Uh, no. I also think that we need to, to um, think about the word rigor. And when does rigor become rigor mortis? You know, that, you, that if rigor is a system that um, actually limits future opportunities, then we have to ask very hard questions about that. We also have to, I think, ask questions about what we mean by standards. And, you know, are we thinking about standards as a relatively technical um, idea? Um, or are we thinking about standards in relation to what matters? And if we think about if what matters, what is in the curriculum, what it matters to be an educated citizen in England in the mid to late 21st century, then standards take on a different kind of idea. So I think we need to interrogate some of the language that we use and think about what these ideas might actually mean in a different future. I love that point about interrogating language. We've almost wanted to kind of collaborate with it with, with a, somebody who's a linguistic expert on some of this because some of these words just get captured, don't they? And, and rigor has just become code for more written exams and it, and it absolutely doesn't have to be. Some of the amazing passage presentations or Peter's students doing oracy work, 
there's no way that that is not rigorous in front of a real audience. It's just a different kind of rigor. Um, um, Peter, perhaps I can draw you in there just on this point about um, assessment and curriculum. They're, they're different, but they're connected. Does one drive the other? How, how can we kind of get into that, changing that? I think if we get the assessment right, it's, it's you know, whatever, whatever that cliche is about the tail wagging the dog. The trouble is the high stakes exams are completely distorting what the curriculum should be which is why when we talk about a more expansive education, we think the single biggest lever, I mean, there's other stuff about Ofsted reform, which obviously uh, is, is detrimental to schools at the moment, but the, it's the high stakes exams that narrows the curriculum in a sort of terrifying way and crowds out the creativity and all the subjects we've talked about today. And so that is why it is so crucial. And then I think the incentives feed back into what is taught and what the education offer is. So that's that's why this is so important. Just to add to the linguistic debate, my, my least favorite is soft skills, which everyone still indulges in. And I always say, is it a hard skill to be able to name the parts of a plant in a biology, a level, uh, biology O level compared with the soft skill of being able to persuade some, someone to do something they don't want to do, which strikes me as far more difficult so uh, we've got to we've got to get rid of soft skills as a phrase that's definitely one for the hit list completely agree peter um now Serene, uh, gordon marsden's asked a really good question in the chat about uh, level one and level two and the importance of kind of getting skills right at that level most of the discourse from government seems to be kind of level three or, or hires is there more that we should do through through the fe sector and beyond for for young people I, at that level I certainly had a good, uh, i mean i disagree I think the conversation has been at a much broader level i do think that um one of the things that as a nation we do not fully appreciate is the breadth of what goes on inside uh, a college and as Paul Kett who's the Director General for Skills at the Department for Education said recently you know people ought to go inside a college uh, and find out what is going on uh, and how uh, people are actually going from if you like no skills right the way through and having opportunities to transform their lives in all kinds of, of ways so i do think i think it is more that society is unaware of what colleges do certainly not government the governments that i speak to are all very very well aware the, but i would have to say um, that we as a co as a society i think need to appreciate colleges more and to understand the real breadth uh, of what is going on and to, to recognize that there is almost no one in our society who could not benefit from um, the skills that can be imparted in the college sector. Thank you, Siri. And um, Alice, I just wanted to bring you back in. The, the, that's been a really rich set of answers. I didn't know if you wanted to just reflect from kind of Edge's perspective on any of those before I pick up with another round of questioning. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ollie. Um, I think um, it, it's the, the reflections and the questions that we've had um, have been have been really good, and I've kind of have, have stretched some of the uh, the uh, the elements of, of what we've we've talked about today. Um, I think that uh, in, increasingly, um, it's how we transfer these conversations into into action. Um, and I sense the frustration that we can see in both the chat and and amongst colleagues is the fact that that is the that is the tricky bit. Um, and so I guess it's how we, we, we use events like today, not just to talk to those people who agree with us, but how we take that to the next level to continue to persuade those that don't yet get this, uh, how important it is. Uh, and that, you know, the moment for change is now. And Peter said earlier that um, we knew this before COVID, but COVID has shone a light on it, it's exacerbated it, and it has increased the necessity uh, to do something different. Thank you, Alice. That's great. Now, um, uh, Lord Shipley, one of the other areas that that kind of came out really strongly in, in your report and links to Sir, Sir Ian's work was just about kind of the funding or the underfunding of further education. I don't know if you wanted to kind of pick up that theme because uh, uh, it came through so strongly in your report. Well, it's absolutely central. I think other speakers have referred to this, but uh, um, uh, th there's, there's been a significant decline um, in the last 10 years in further education. And uh, it's been caused by general budget pressures, um, increased spending in other areas of the education uh, budget system. 
you see in the uh, loans uh, announcement this morning that um, uh, you know there's just great, very great pre pressure on on the treasury. Um, I think that we will not um, we, you you will not increase the number of apprenticeships being undertaken. You will not deliver the um, uh, objectives of the uh, skills bill uh, unless there is a new funding settlement for further education. Um, and uh, so I think this is absolutely central. And uh, as long as the funding regime we have now stays, as opposed to um, uh, being modelled on the university system, which follows, uh, follows the student, um, we're going to have trouble into the future. But it, 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 I think this may right itself, you see, because um, the country's going into a shortage of skills. Um, it's very obvious that this is, to me that this is going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and so government is going to be confronted with, so what do we do? Um, employers will be limited as to how much they're prepared to put in, uh, but will, I think, have to put in more than they currently do. Um, the government will have to come up with tax incentives for uh, smaller businesses, uh, for SMEs to, uh, uh, to get them to engage further in, in, in training. But... Uh, the kind of localization of the skills agenda through local partnerships in the future, I think is going to work, um, uh, uh, could work, but people need to use the mechanisms that are going to be at their disposal. Thank you, Lord Chipley. And Sarian, you mentioned some of the more recent work of, of the Commission looking at uh, the kind of stronger links between the FE and HE sector. And as we've said in, in Wales, there's kind of a, in particular, a strong move towards that tertiary sector. What, why is marketisation such a strong element of England? And, and should we be pushing more for collaboration between sectors? I think, I think if you look at the white paper, the white paper talks about collaboration all the time. Uh, and I think that collaboration is absolutely critical. And I think the collaboration between colleges, which I, I, I talked to, and the partnership with employers is absolutely central. And I do think uh, that making the white paper work is really, really important. And I agreed with everything in it. The second point I would just make is that I think we do need to um, push and encourage the kinds of collaborations that do exist between universities and colleges and to celebrate those that uh, are, are um, really working. I was talking at the University of Surrey uh, a couple of months ago uh, and they had many, many students uh, in Farnborough College. Uh, and those would often be students who, who wouldn't be able to be able to travel to the university. So I think um, we should be focusing very much on the collaboration between colleges and critically with employers uh, and also on really enabling uh, collaboration uh, between universities and colleges particularly as I say bringing people often some of those people who start at level one as I addressed in my last one do not have the ability to just move around for all kinds of reasons and therefore we need to enable them to achieve whatever level is best for them, but to do so in the environment uh, that is closest to them. And that's why I think having a, a really good partnerships between universities and colleges is so important. Thank you, Sirian. That's really helpful. Um, now, Peter, on, on the kind of curriculum side, uh, we've talked a little, we've talked a lot in this session about how some of the accountability measures are driving a narrowness of the curriculum. One of the kind of possible recommendations in Lord Shipley's report was around perhaps moving Progress 8 to Progress 5, a smaller core. From your kind of school experience, what, what's needed there to, to re-broaden the curriculum rather than narrow it? I mean, that's one of the possible policies. I mean, it's, it's only fairly recently that we had five A stars to C rather than eight being what was happening in English schools. So it's uh, the Progress 8 is only quite a recent one. Um, I think we've got to have a very narrow core. We No one disputes English and maths. There'd be one or two other subjects we'd put in there. And then flexibility, as we're saying on that learner profile and that qualification I showed, of saying, well, then there's a menu of other skills, of other qualifications of interdisciplinary learning and you're picking from that far wider menu and someone might choose to go down a a more narrow uh, academic route although it would be compulsory to do some of those elements um, but everyone would have to have a broad curriculum but there are things to start you know 
today there are schools where children are doing 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 GCSEs. If, if every school cut it back to no more than eight, occasionally if you're doing triple science, nine, then you'd have more time in your curriculum just by doing that under the current system. So there are stepping stones immediately. You could specify that every child should do a creative subject, even if it's not necessarily in the, in the EBAC. You know, so there are ways under the current system that we can take the first steps towards that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm going to come to Rachel Louise with one final question in just a moment, but then I'm just giving the panellists notice that I'm going to come around to everyone just for a final sentence for our uh, audience to take away. So let that mull in your brains. But Rachel Louise, youth voice is clearly really important to you both from what you said. Uh, I loved one of the, the well, I, I loved, but was upset by one of the headlines that from your pieces, Rachel, where you want, where the young people have been talking about this drive for exam and exam and exam. It really kind of came through strongly. So I just wanted to get both of your perspectives on, you know, why is youth voice so important and, and how can we kind of bring that a bit more into the discourse here? Rachel, perhaps you'd like to go first. Yeah, of course. Um, we've set up youth panels um, and we've kept them in, in fairly small age groups so that the young people and children feel, uh, feel confident to speak. So we've, we've had groups of about eight, I think it's four groups of about eight young people of different ages who we've been hearing from, and we're going to be hearing from regularly through the year. Um, and uh, I suppose three things have come out really strongly to me. Among the youngest, they just this yearning for creativity. That's the word they use the whole time. They want more uh, creativity, more um, the imagination they talk about. They want more, um, it's not, not about fun. It's about doing things that they want, they feel is going to sort of pr provoke their curiosity. Uh, and they volunteer that. Um, and that's there. Uh, we ask them, you know, what would they like to have more on in school? What would they like to, if they could add a subject into the curriculum, what would it be? Um, and then for the slightly older young people, um, just the scale of the mental health uh, issues. So I, I think everybody in the panels either had had a problem or knew someone with a problem. It was really striking and shocking. Um, it's a really universal uh, issue um, across the country, different geographical areas, different social backgrounds, um, uh, uh, post-pandemic, but also pre-pandemic. It was something that was long-standing and certainly, and the third thing is they uh, felt that the exam culture was certainly driving that, uh, but also um, narrowing the education uh, and, and they just felt that it was just all about exams and that was the only measure of success and they wanted more uh, and they felt it wasn't preparing them for the future or for their the jobs they might want to do uh, and they were more ambitious they were more ambitious than the adults who've created this system for the education system uh, and I think that's exciting I think they you know they they want more uh, and they should get more. Thanks, Rachel. A quick word on Youth Voice, Louise, and then we'll come around for some closing thoughts. Sorry, I think I would support everything that Rachel has said. I also think that um, young people tell it as it is. They're the ones who are experiencing, they're the ones who are living through the experience, and therefore they have a clarity that actually those of us who are on the other side of the pain barrier sometimes lose. So I think that that's absolutely crucial. In Scotland, just now, I'm, I'm starting a piece of work for the Cabinet Secretary on reviewing the qualification system in Scotland. And one of the things that I'm doing just now is designing the project with members of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And it's really interesting the way that it, it takes thinking. Um, but I think that as a society, we underestimate um, constantly the contribution that young people can make, and it is their future. Very well put, Louise. So just a, a brief closing thought for, from everyone, a, a sentence or two. Lord Shipley, your closing thought for, for the audience. Well, I suppose it is what happens next. And uh, um, uh, if you want to affect change, everybody has to engage with that. And um, uh, so will everybody please decide what it is that they are going to do themselves, have their own um, uh, action plan for supporting one or more of the um, uh, issues that we've been talking about today and then do something about it. So my first next step is that next Friday, I will be staying an extra day in London, not returning to Newcastle until um, uh, Friday night, because 
there is a second reading of a private member's bill on careers guidance in schools, and it gives me the opportunity to promote the um, Select Committee report. Thank you, Lord Shipley. Rachel, your closing thought. I'd just say that this is a reset moment. You know, the pandemic is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. And the system has been shut down, restarted, uh, like turning on the computer off and on. Uh, and that creates a huge chance to do things differently and really think again. And I think people's mindsets have been, minds have been opened up to how things could be different. Uh, and we mustn't waste that opportunity. Beautifully put. Peter. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think joining things up is so important, which is why what Edge have done today, bringing everyone together, I think is, is, is a real moment. And we've got to continue to do that. We've got to be more than the sum of our parts. We've got to show that we can, and I think this has got to be bottom up. I think 80% of this is showing, I think Lord Shipley said earlier on, politicians often follow what's going on rather than sort of always lead it. If we can show this is working, if we can show people are using the learner profile, we can show there are other methods of assessment and other ways of doing the curriculum, politicians will have to follow. So we've got to provide the evidence and then do that 20% as well of the advocacy work that comes out of this. But we've got to be more than the sum of our parts. Thank you, Peter. Louise? For me, it's collaboration. Every, everyone, nothing changes unless everyone changes. And people need a reason for change. The issue that was raised earlier about, um, Peter, you were raising the issue about um, schools doing nine GCSEs. I mean, often the reason for that is because of parental pressure, because parents aren't believe that the more the better, the more qualifications you have, the better the opportunities your young person is going to have. So this is about cultural shift. And all of these people, all of these groups, parents, teachers, professionals, um, politicians, everyone has to be part of this discussion because there needs to be a clear reason for change. And everyone needs to believe that what's coming will make life better for them and for their, their children. Thank you, Louise. Sirian. Thank you. I uh, just uh, would be quite short but just to say, I think we need to recognize that colleges are thought too often as being about apprenticeships. Now they are about apprenticeships and the apprenticeships are wonderful things, but they are very, very much more than that. Taking people from level one right the way through and celebrating subjects right through the social and sciences and humanities through uh, to the natural sciences and including a real opportunity for partnership with local employers in innovation and improving productivity. So I encourage everyone to spend a little time inside a college and see what's going on. It's an unbelievable eye opener. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Alice, final word. Uh, thank you, Ollie, and thank you uh, to all the panellists for such a, a rich discussion. I think two things kind of uh, come to mind. One is uh, an opportunity to create a level playing field. You know, life isn't fair, but we can certainly start to stack the cards in favour of all rather than in favour of a few. Um, and the other thing that strikes me is um, this idea around social capital. You know, some young people really have that. And if we were able to affect some of the changes that have been talked about today, we could allow all young people to be able to develop that social capital. So around contacts, around resilience, around teamwork, all the things that we know, as Peter said, that awful phrase of soft skills, all the things that we actually know employers are really looking for, that young people need to survive in this world, to be good citizens, to be part of their community and to be successful in the world of work. We need to build that social capital in for them. What a great place to end. Huge thanks to all of the panellists for your time and for all of the work that you're doing. And thank you to, for listening as well. Have a great rest of your day.